you talk a bit about that? Yes, I think if we, starting with the, the end of your uh, uh, comment right now, I think that this is exactly the point. I had, from the very beginning, a problem with fiqh al-aqaliyat, the fiqh of minority. Because the perception is we live in a non-Muslim majority society. So what we have to do is to come with a set of rules helping us to protect ourselves from the surrounding society because it's a non-Muslim majority country. So we have our set of rules. So I, that's fine. As a step, I can understand that we need protection, exactly like uh, through history, when you arrive in a new country, the first normal attitude of any uh, migrant is protection. I want to be protected. But then the step forward is really to say, okay, what is the substance of this? What, what is the understanding, the mindset that is nurturing this? And for me, as we come back to the scriptural sources and the legal tradition by saying, do we have to nurture a binary vision of these legal traditions, or is it is there something which is deeper than that, which is the essence and the ends? And this is why Madrasat al-Maqasid here is quite important, is the school of the objectives. What the, it's to read the law in the light of the objective, and not to read the law by saying it's a Muslim mind who produced the law so it's Islamic. No, not this. What are the ends? And this is why by saying this, to, in Muslim majority countries as well as here, when you look at the ends and the objectives, you change your mind by saying, look, the American Constitution and the laws of this country telling you that you and me before law, we are equal. The fact that I am here today challenging a wrong decision to say this is wrong because it's unjust, this is my Sharia. It's not something which is American and not me. The substance is equal rights and justice. So if, it's come, if it comes from a non-Muslim mind, you integrate this, not only to be integrated, but to integrate this into something which is my framework. My legal tradition is integrating this as something which is a non-Muslim mind has produced over history the same principles in the light of the same objectives. So this is mine. But you can understand how much, uh, how, you know, the, the kind of a problem that I can have with some Muslim scholars saying, what are you talking about? This is almost, you are not far from kufr. So I got this, but the point for me is really to challenge this. And when you come to Muslim majority countries, you say, okay, we had the rhetoric under the nation state discussion, the, the, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the, the 20th century, even from you know, my own family, Hassan and Banna, and all the school of the Muslim Brotherhood, is to speak about uh, an Islamic state. I say, okay, what do you mean by qualif qualifying a state as Islamic? Is it because the laws are coming from a very closed universe of reference, or are we talking about principles and objectives that we are respecting? In this, I'm challenging this qualification by saying, I know what is a state respecting principles and trying to read the objectives, but I'm not going to qualify, for example, qualifying the world. I'm not using, for example, something which is called the Islamic world. I'm speaking about Muslim majority countries. This is where the Muslims are in majority, but it doesn't mean that they are respecting the principles and the objectives. And exactly the same here. I'm not in the Western countries where we are in minority. I'm a citizen, so I'm part of the majority, and I am sharing principles and values with the majority. So it's an ongoing discussion that we have to have here, and this is why our experience as Western Muslims will have a tremendous, and is already have, a tremendous impact on what is happening in Muslim majority countries. But we should question the very on, all understanding and what we repeat as, oh, this is the way we reform our mind. You know, very often people are saying, you know, the whole framework of the Islamic reform is to differentiate between Sharia and Fiqh. Fiqh, it's a moving process and Sharia is sacred. I say, come on, let us speak about Sharia and your understanding of Sharia and you will see that even the Sharia with the, the principles is something which is built through interpretations and, and it's, it's a structure that is produced by human interpretation. Of course, we are speaking about universal, immutable principles, but be careful not to confuse the framework with the principles that are helping you to construct the framework, to build the framework. So this is a very deep discussion, and I think that we are starting it now in something which is an ongoing discussion between East and West. And this is exactly what I want to do now. I, I really want to have this discussion between the West and the Eastern countries, but also between scholars of the text and scholars of the context. Because the scholars of the context who have 
an ethical concern could help a great deal uh, can, could, in, in the way we deal with the texts. Final uh, question, so we can go to the audience. This will require and test your diplomatic skills. <laughs> I'm sure the audience would like to know uh, just a short list of some of the um, Muslim thinkers today that, uh, um, and personalities that you think they um, should um, read about uh, in order to have a, a good sense of you know, what's going on. There's, there are lots of people. You know, for example, you mentioned many in your book even and, and right now. I think that uh, no one can today, for example, in the, in the realm of reform and what is happening in the Muslim majority countries as well as now, could get a sense of what is happening or, or the way things are moving if you don't, for example, come back to Yusuf al-Qardawi. Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi, it's central. The problem is that some are targeting him and trying to remove him from the picture for things that he said about you know, the Palestinian resistance or some of the things that he's saying about very traditional things. And he said this, many of them, he said them 30 years ago. And they are referring to Al-Halal or Al-Haram, one of the books that he wrote when he was very young. But he's moving. What The last book he wrote on jihad, for example, it's quite interesting. The way he is challenging what we, we thought he thought. No, this is a very important point. So I may disagree with him. Mm. You know, in many discussions, he publicly said, I don't agree with Tariq Ramadan on some of the issues. And I don't agree with him. For example, even the way he speaks about the West. I understand he is very open, one of the most open scholars. But on this, I think that we have to be very cautious. A scholar is not black and white. You may disagree on some you know, political stance, but you cannot just remove him. And he helped a, 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 a great deal this to, to happen. So this is a very important figure. Uh, in the tradition, Muhammad al-Ghazali also was very influential. Today, we have Ibn uh, Ben Baya. Ben Baya also is a very, from Mauritania, he is working on, on you know, between the West and the East, he's, he's there. And you have the people that you are mentioning. For example, you, you speak about Abdel Hakim uh, Murad, Tim Winter, who is also uh, working in, 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 in this. And we have, you know, here, uh, Abul Fadl is also someone who is uh, important. I would say, for example, even though it was very controversial in the Muslim majority countries and, and in the West, that Amina Wadud, in what she was saying about the way we have to read the Quran, is interesting. We took her on one of the positions that, you know, I think it was not wise to do it the way she did it. I think it was not, because the authority in Islam is not in the way you lead the prayer, is can you be a alim? A scholar? Can you be a faqih? Can you be a qadi, which is a jurist or a judge? These are the, the, the center of authority. So to come with this, I think it's, it's a good question, because still, I, 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 I wouldn't go the, the way uh, uh, Tim Winter went that you were mentioning. But I would, I would, I, I found uh, Ali Juma because I, I forgot to mention Ali Juma as someone also who is trying to come with something which is quite interesting today. For me, it's the future is the re this relationship between a, a mystic tradition, the mystical tradition, it's about Sufism, but also a legal tradition. He's reconciling and trying to reconcile us with something which is the, the, the stand of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, a very old you know, uh, tradition of being at the same time very concerned about legal issues, but no legal issues without spirituality. Don't come with the law for getting the spirit. Don't come with the limits for getting the direction. Don't come with the mind for getting the heart. And I think that this is quite interesting today. So there are lots of people I cannot, I don't have time, but between the two, uh, uh, well, and then you mention also people who are not really scholars, but really addressing the audience. Sometimes they convey very traditional uh, uh, thinking or sometimes you know, challenging. And I think that you are right. These are people who are not, uh, perceived as scholars, but they are shaping an understanding. They are shaping a vision, and we have also to take this into account. And then beyond this, we have also intellectuals that are also, through their critical thinking, helping us to, to, to move ahead. And, and, and you know, I may disagree with uh, some of the intellectuals, for example, Nasr Abu Zaid or Sorush, 
but I think they are very, very instrumental. The critical questions they are asking are helping us, we may disagree or not, but they are helping us to come to an, an, uh, uh, a critical discussion, an open discussion. And I think that the future is for this, the future for the Muslims to be able to manage the reality